man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. This is the first line of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Social Contract, one of the foundational texts of modern political theory and philosophy. It's a text that asks a very basic question. Why do we trade in our freedoms to live in society if society is made by humans? Why don't we construct society in different ways to ensure that we really can maximize all the freedoms we want to live? I spoke with Melissa Schwartzberg, Silva Professor of Politics at New York University, who is an expert in the theory and principles of democracy, on the threats that democracy face, and how to maintain a society that is truly fair and equal. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. So, Melissa, I'm so happy you're here today. First of all, thank you for coming on to talk to me about Rousseau and Think About It. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So, so, so just before we started, you said, uh, what's your feeling about <laughs> the social contract or the, sec the discourse, the second discourse on the origin and foundations of inequality? Well, I feel passionately about the second discourse. It's perhaps my favorite text in the history of political thought. Um, but it's really hard to teach and it's hard to talk about because in ways it's, uns it's unsystematic. Whereas social contract, I think, is much more systematic, but it's in a way a harder text to love. Right. And the second discourse, I've taught it a lot, and I actually love it because it tells a story. Yes. And it has this captivating story of our progress from the state of nature, what we used to be, to where we are today. So it sort of is both a theory but also a narrative. Yes. Yes, it is that. And then the question is, of course, and I'm sure we're going to get there, what are we supposed to learn from this narrative? Because it's not a historical narrative. It's, it is, in a way, a genealogy. But why should that have any sort of bearing on, on the basic questions of whether or not it's justified, whether inequality is justified? And the questions that's, that he raises are still with us today. Yes. The big questions. So when you teach us, you put it into a larger context of your interest in democracy yes. and the rights of people. So what are the big questions? Then we can go back. How does he lay this out? Well, there are, there are a few. I, it's harder to think about it exactly from a democratic theory perspective. Social contract is much more amenable to that. Um, although I do sometimes still teach it in, in a democratic theory sort of way. For me, I think the big questions are under what circumstances uh, would inequality be justified? We observe this extraordinary increase in inequality today. And so, and I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with it. Economic inequality. Economic inequality. It's the big buzzword, right? Economic inequality is a huge buzzword. I think a lot of us are also interested in political inequality increasingly. How to think about the nature of representative government. Uh, do we feel that our elected uh, representatives are unaccountable in particular ways. So that's another sort of question. But yes, economic inequality is perhaps the defining question of our time. And so Rousseau gives us a sense of how we might think about it. And would you include in political inequality also the great equality movements of our country? Yes. Sort of from all men are created equal to sort of the abolition of slavery, the civil yes. rights movement, women's yes. suffrage, LGBT movements. So all the movements that have shaped our nation are linked to equality and inequality. Absolutely, absolutely. And even, you know, the, the more ephemeral, I don't know if it's really ephemeral, but a question like um, gerrymandering is oh, basically right. a question about political equality and political inequality and how we want to be represented as a people. Okay. And, who, and this is about who can participate in Who can participate process? under what, uh, to what extent do we want parties to be dictating the, um, the scope of political districting? The questions right, like that right. are basically also questions about political equality, but they're fairly far from what Rousseau would be. But Rousseau opens there. up this question, right? Yes. For, and in a radical and really incredibly influential way. I yes. Mean, if we give a list of the people he influenced, it's the huge range from the French Revolution to Lenin, from Thoreau to Tolstoy. Right. So it's just, and to the debates that you just named. 
But when you go back, what, what, is interest, what interests him in this moment, at this moment to write the second discourse? Well, he's prompted to write it, right? Like he's <laughs> answering this question. He, you know, he won this essay competition from the Academy of Dijon for the first discourse. And so he's, he's being presented by this question for the Academy. And so that's what seems to be, uh, that's the immediate cause of him writing right. this essay. But of course, it sets him on this much broader story of, of the origins of political society and their justification. And the people issuing this contest probably did not expect that this would be submitted. <laughs> they didn't quite think that someone Perhaps said. not. I mean, you have this, uh, the, the uh, epistle uh, dedicatory, this letter that precedes right. it, in which, yes, he's, uh, he's saying, yes, if I could be born anywhere, it would be this lovely, this would be Geneva with all of these various features that we see today. Um, and one wonders whether or not, in a way, it's to defang people who might otherwise right. be very taken aback by what, right. what follows. And he's born in Geneva, yeah. son of a watchmaker, yeah. a very wealthy city, yeah. independent, so he's not yeah. Swiss, not French, yes. not European, yes. which is interesting because all the debates yes. about Europe today, sort of Rousseau is a kind of free from certain things, from certain yes. legions, national legions. And then yes. he gets locked out famously out of yes. Geneva when he was 16 because the city gates close at night, and he says, I'm just going to turn my back on this freedom, this amazing, wealthy, independent yeah. city, and go wander off yes. and think about <laughs> these issues. And so the, the question of inequality, why does he get so interested in it? Because he lives in a very privileged position. He's not formally educated, but he could just say, well, people of my standing live this way, and other people are maybe not as fortunate. Yeah. I mean, I think he is deeply preoccupied with the justification of political society, but he thinks to get to that, well, I'm sorry, uh, uh, political regimes, what, what would make political authority justified? But I think he's using the second discourse as a way into these sorts of questions right. and to think about what is it about right. human beings and how they interact in society that makes them prone to certain types of inegalitarian political arrangements and right. how we might be able to transition from those to more egalitarian ones to freer ones. And where we are today when he takes stock of where he is, he says we come from another place. Yes. We all come from the state of nature. Can you give um, me an account of what is this, this story, this kind of dramatic narrative, it's like a Yuval Harari kind of story <laughs> from the origin of us to today? <laughs> well. I think, I mean, he begins the second discourse in this very fa with these very famous uh, lines, and I have them here. It's this, and we've talked about this. This is book uh, one, chapter one. Man mm -hmm. is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One believes himself the other's master, and yet is more of a slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? I believe I can solve this question. So in a way, by the time he's in the second, he's into the social contract, he's not interested in its in the genealogy, he's not interested in origins anymore. He's right. thinking about, okay, here, wherever we are, right. here is how we might make political society legitimate. Right. But in part because of the way in which the question is formulated by the Academy of Dijon, he's forced in a way to think about our, the origins because they're asking him about what is the origin of inequality among men and whether it is authorized by the natural law. Would he necessarily have gone into this genealogy uh -huh. Uh -huh. absent that prompt? I don't know, but it does, of course, it ushers in this whole long um, tradition of genealogy and critique in so doing. Right. Um, and he's not, of course, interested at all, or he immediately says, look, I'm not giving you a, a real historical story. I'm giving you a hypothetical right. story. I'm giving right. you an account of how, it, of how it might be. And it's hypothetical because he wants to posit something. But what's interesting, he posits right. human nature. That's so right. man is born free. Yes. There's this kind of origin point, but everywhere he's in chains. Yes. So we're we yeah. all in chains today. We're all in chains. Why are we in chains? We're free people. Yes. He doesn't believe that we are free people living in any kind of civilized society, right? Civilization does not liberate no. us, actually. And that's the kind of radical reversal, right? He says, actually, we became civilized or cultured or assumed yes. to live on systems, and that made us unfree. Yes. So yes. the beginning point, when you said it's, it's a mythology or yes. it's a metaphor, let's say it's not yes. an actual, and he, he says himself, I'm not really talking about people who ever existed. But that somehow stays with me sort of to think, okay, people at one point, first of all, that we are historical, that human nature changes. Yes. It's not eternal. And we arrived in a position that we can then question. Yes. Well, so... 
it's kind of interesting. So he posits these two basic features of human nature, the inclination towards self-preservation and to natural pity. And um, that gets, that's what we really have in this first account of the state of nature. That's what drives us. But of course, we also have this tendency, this uh, inclination towards, um, towards, well, uh, to describe it as an inclination is not quite right, but this uh, capacity for perfectibility. That is, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we meet new challenges and we're going to perfect our skills in response to them. And mm -hmm. so, and that is part of what ends up driving much of what happens in the histor in the so-called mm -hmm. historical account. You know, we're, here we are in the state of nature, we're radically isolated from each other. Right. And we're encountering these new obstacles. And we have this sort of first feelings of pride as we encounter these new obstacles, but we're, it's not going to be, in, that itself is not going to be the origin of inequality, although you get this moment where he's saying, well, you know, this inclination to feel like, here I am mastering nature in a particular way. Right, and I can that, oh, yes. feel a little good about it, but feel a little good about it, it. it's passing, it's a passing yes, thing. Right. It doesn't yet that's corrupt right. us the way no, you will talk later. No, 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 um, But there's this transition, of course, in the genealogy itself from this moment where we're radically isolated, we're coming together just to mate, basically, and then we go off in our separate ways. We have no stable residencies. We have no we have no society. Even you know m the maternal bond is not natural, right. or it's there only insofar as our children can go. You know, uh, are capable of taking care of themselves. That's not going to be enduring. This family life is not a feature of this of of natural right. man for Rousseau. It's, but over time, there are, the obstacles get greater and we start depending on each other in a particular way and we have this transition into what, he, what has come to be referred to as the golden age, even though Rousseau himself doesn't use that term, in which we have this very lovely rustic life of huts. Right. But it's with that stability of the family structure, that stability of society, which we start having, we have a little bit, you know, we're doing some work, we're taking care of ourselves, but we also have some leisure time and we're gonna fill our leisure time with dancing and performing for each other. And that's where things start going deeply awry. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that still sounded kind of good. <laughs> it all sounds really good. And he actually says, look, if we had been able to stay in that state, yeah. This initial state of amour, of what he's going to refer to as amour propre, this right. you know, this desire for esteem, um, it might have been okay. Things go deeply off the rails in a moment, <laughs> but at the but, what's important I think to note is that this moment in which we're seeking recognition for our for our ability to dance for each other, to entertain each other, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's it's that impulse for recognition that ends up being the true origin of inequality for Rousseau. Okay. That's where he's going to locate it. Um, and of course, that struggle for recognition is going to be very important for later thinkers, and that's part of what they're going to yeah. latch on to. But we see it for the first time there. And do, what happens to a person? Do we lose ourselves a little bit? Because I start thinking, I want you yeah. to think of me in certain ways, yeah. or to be yeah. impressed by this or that. Right. Right, it's this process of alienation, yeah? That we, at first, we're the judges only of our own merit, that we have the satisfaction of having ca you know, caught a hair or having climbed a tree a particular way or whatever. Right. Whatever challenge has been, um, has been posed to us, we've been able, we've had this internal, yay, good for us. But that's a very right. different experience than saying, than thinking constantly, how am I being perceived by other people? And this is something I think that's really you know, if you want to think about contemporary resonance, when we think about the pathologies of social media, things like that. You but know, it we seems to haunt all of philosophy yeah. then yeah. afterwards. Yeah. It's in a way, yes. consciousness, awareness, alienation, yes. self-regard. I mean, yes. it, you can track yes. it from Rousseau through the entire yes. 19th century yes. to the questions of authenticity, yes. even to the, the Western engagement with Eastern philosophy, where sort of being, you know, at peace with yourself, a kind of Buddhist enlightenment, very different from our enlightenment, yes. where you would be fully aware Yes. But lost to yourself also. Right. So we lose that. So we go from this, this moment, and then when things really go off the rails, what happens then? <laughs> well, the more dependent we are on each other, the worse things are, as it turns okay. out. So the, the next, so there's this original state of nature, the re, so there's the first very isolated, atom, what do we call it? Um, atomistic sort of state of nature. Right. 
then we're coming together and we're in these, these rustic huts with a very simple life. We're basically still um, capable of satisfying our basic needs. But with the advent of metallurgy and agriculture, mm -hmm. suddenly we move into this new type of sort of state of nature. But we're, because we need each other so much, we have these huge collective projects okay. to undertake. It is with that that some people, so there are, there's always going to be, he suggests, a degree of natural inequality. Some people are going to be stronger, some people may be brighter, more adept in different sorts of ways. Right. But it's only with these very big projects that these natural inequalities start becoming more and more pronounced and codified as people, you know, as these collective projects um, take hold and you start having to have people who are in charge and directing it. And it's this way that the natural inequality, become, uh, the natural and physical inequality becomes this sort of more instituted inequality. So civilization brings civilization. out greater inequality. Yes. So of course some people are faster. More yes. depth and he does say one thing about property. Yes. So he says the first man who put a stick in yeah. the ground and said, this is mine, you can't step on this. Yes. Like he yes. kind of ruined everything for yes. everyone. Yes, I love this. I love this. And it's such a vivid image. Yes. You kind of picture this person in the forest. Yes, yes. And it's important to say that this is mine and found people sufficiently simple, stupid enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. This is the founder of civil society who says, this yes. is my space. This is my space. Part of the planet, part of the earth belongs yes. to me and you can't yes. step on it. Yes. And I'm going to cultivate my right. maize or whatever, my right. corn, whatever it is, and right. figure it out. And I may actually give you a little if you start helping me out. Right. And so now we're suddenly in civilization in right. a system of relations, which yes. he says this is the end of our freedom. That's right. That's right. And, and then as you, it institutes inequalities. Yes. And but it's actually interesting, sorry, that property becomes the lever or the key to a lot of this thinking, right? That yes. property is the downfall, which will lead us to the kind of Marxist revolution to think property is the key to understand how inequality is instituted. Yes, although it, it is worth noting that in social contract, it's not as if he doesn't want to have a property, but it's going to be limited in a particular way. It's going to be limited by essentially the conditions of freedom, mm -hmm. that it can't be. So the specific thing is that, um, and this is from social contract, this is in book two, chapter 11, that as for wealth, no citizen be so very rich that he can buy another, and none so poor that he is compelled to sell himself. Th those are the limits. So it's not as if property as such okay. is going to be illegitimate. Yeah. Nonetheless, the, institu the, in, um, the institution of property is, is a source of inequality. The question is, how much inequality yeah, can we bear right. before it yields unfreedom? Which is really a question we live with today. Yes, I mean, right. the whole 1% debate sort of yes. say, what's too much on one side? Why is wealth accumulated to one or few percent and the rest of the people are? He would say, those people own those other people. Yes. And those other people have to enslave themselves, sell yes. themselves, their labor, their alienated labor. Yes. So it's a really relevant question. So, so now we're in this, so civilization now takes hold and it doesn't produce the results that actually I think at this point people had assumed it would, right? Right. They had assumed state of nature with savages living in the forest. That's not neither happy nor free. And he says, no, that's actually happy. That's free. And where we are today is unfree. Yes. I mean, of course, there's a long tradition that he's relying on in terms of state of, in terms of appeal to a pre-political society. Right. And of course, there's this uh, robust social contract tradition. There's Hobbes and Locke. Right. Uh, most centrally. Right. As, as and is he responding think. actively to these ideas? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think he is. He has is no formal training, but he knows he's doing Yes, Hobbes in particular. There yeah. are clear moments where he's breaking with Hobbes. There's, you know, there are clear responses to Grotius. Um, right. I think that he's uh, indebted to Pufendorf. There right. are, you know, so other key so figures sources. in this tradition. The yeah, big absolutely. difference to Hobbes is the understanding of human nature. Right. I, what it looks like, what the state of nature looks like, which is famously a war of all against all. Right, in Hobbes. Yeah, in yeah. Hobbes. So, right. And Hobbes basically thinks we're pretty horrible people, uh, generally, or defensive at least. We're, we are rationally inclined to strike first because we okay. know... I don't think that he thinks that we're necessarily venal. As a, but, we're rationally but, inclined to strike Right, first. right, right. We need to, you know, nobody's going to protect us except right. ourselves. And what's Rousseau's idea of? 
And um, for Rousseau, I mean, the basic, the original, again, the original state of nature, we're not encountering each other very much. Right, we're just passing That's right. sort of in the That's forest right. occasionally. But yeah. I think this part of Rousseau captured the imagination of people in the 18th century. Oh, absolutely. And in the novels yeah, and this book on education, there's a kind of what we would today call romantic. Of course, he's yes. considered the father of romanticism, yes. but romantic with a capital R. There's yes. a romantic idea of human beings at one point were content. Right. right. Different from Hobbes, where you sort of strife is the oh, beginning. Oh, right. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> yes, for a lot of the Hobbes were much happier. I mean, really, even in Second Disc, I'm sorry, even in Social Contract, he talks about can we think of any happier group than peasants deciding under an oak tree what they should do? Right. There is this sense that, that the less complex our right. society right. gets, the happier we are. Right. And in, in um, Julie, La Nou the New Eloise, in the beginning when he's hosted by some people in a valley or something, there's something close to perfection when he has yeah. meals with them. Yes. Um, he, said there's, he said there's small enough a community. They rely on one another. These merchants pass through. He said yes. we don't really have business with them. We don't overcharge them. They stay with us. And it's quite interesting what he finds fault with. Yes says that the women don't sit at table seems wrong with him, kind of a strange moment. And, but so he finds these moments in his society still, yes. right, of people living together yes. in a sort of communal sense that yes. could be preserved. Yes. So I think there's this, this part of the romantic idea, which you can also track all the way through Thoreau, Emerson, to environmentalism today, kind of that we could return. And what do you, how do you explain this idea that you said it's a metaphor, it's a mythology, but it's, a, it's presented as a history or as a story. Yes. Um, so, again, I think part of it is, is the way in which the, he's being, I mean, he's trying to win an essay contest and he's being given a prompt in a way, just like right. any of our good students would be doing. <laughs> right, right, right. You want to answer the question like, fully. Right. Nonetheless, he doesn't, I th and he thinks that getting the origin story historically right, it doesn't matter, but getting yeah. it conceptually right yeah. is going to be important. So, I mean, one big question is whether this <laughs> is the issue of what's called the genetic fallacy. So why does where something come from have any bearing on whether or not it's right or just? Okay. Um, this is a big question for political theorists all the time. So okay. you're telling a historical story, you're giving an account of where institutions, I mean, the sort of work I do, is where institutions come from. But why does where institutions come from have any bearing whatsoever on whether or not it's justified. Because you would think, well, if they come from this place and they've been with us for so long, if they become the rule and we accept them? Or right, and maybe, and well, wherever they came from, we can now look at, I mean, it may, you know, things that may have come from a very bad place, but if the institutions are basically just, I mean, right. if, you know, if they're yielding, you know, uh, distributively fair, right. uh, you know, if they're serving whatever sorts of values that we, that. Uh, we take to be important today, in a way it doesn't matter that they were imposed upon us if they're currently just. So there's a revolution right. and then they, people impose new laws on everybody against their will, but those laws turn out to be okay. Right. Yeah. Or if we today, um, if we imagine that we had a completely pro procedurally fair process by which we, I, we created norms that were ended up being pernicious, the fact that they were created via this, this set of fair procedures right. in a way is not going to have a whole lot of bear. I mean, I think it does have some bearing, but we yeah. might think that it right. doesn't have a whole right. lot of bearing on whether or not we think right. that current institutions are just. So the trick in Rousseau is to figure out what the work the genealogy is supposed to do. Right. I mean, at this again, this is a big question. It's a big question for, you know, for Nietzsche, it's for Co. Any, you know, the whole history of genealogy. Right. Um, the genealogy, genealogy, but. Um, different from history, in a way. Different so from history. So tell me again the difference between just a regular historical account versus what you're calling genealogy. So I think what he, I think we have to think about what he's doing since he's not interested in getting the history right. Right. He's thinking about it as a basis for uh, for a basis for critique. Okay. So one way to think about what genealogy does is to denaturalize mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm. particular institutions. So it might be that we think, well, you know. Certain features of the human condition or certain institutions are just inescapable. Right. Right? We couldn't do otherwise. Or if we tried to do otherwise, we would do, it would be incredibly costly and difficult. Or against our own nature. Or right? against our own so nature. Like family we would... structure, let's say. Let's say a exactly. thing like, you know, 
it's best that very, very small infants are raised by women. Yes. Because their mothers have a maternal, right. natural, so it's natural. That's right. That's right. So he says, well, is it really natural? So he wants to get the story right to say, well, maybe this is a cultural convention. Right. We could think differently. Yes. So it opens up this space for a lot of people afterwards to do work with it. Right. Rather than assuming some things are just natural. Right. And let's go back for a moment to the natural yeah. inequality. Yeah. So some people are stronger. Yeah. So men go out and hunt, yeah. right, supposedly. Women yeah. stay home, tend yeah. to the fire, right? So he takes all this apart yes. in a way. So that's just not a basis for moral and equal, political inequality. So that's true. Some people are stronger, but that does not justify. So this is a huge opening in the thinking because until then, everybody could justify. I'm highborn in the aristocracy or God appointed me to be king, <laughs> etc. Right, right. Or having been con uh, conquered in a war constitutes a justification for political rule. Which know. is another origin myth. Yeah, in a another way. origin myth. Yeah. Right. So there are a bunch of different origin myths, and he wants to essentially puncture all of that. I mean, the example right. of the family is really important because he's saying, no, virtually every institution you might pick out as being natural is in fact artificial. Wow. Yeah. So it opens up really kind of political philosophy to something new? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. what do people do with that? Because, I mean, what's the response when people say, no, 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 you can't sort of talk about all institutions as cultural. Some are eternal, universal, static. Yes. So there's, that's going to be one response. One response is to say, well, no, look, there are going to be features that Rousseau's uh, critique goes too far. I mean, he says specifically, look, Hobbes claims that he's, that he's depicting natural man. In fact, he's depicting ci uh, civil man already, right? right. right? He's projecting so he back onto yes. the nature, okay. Right, so he wants to go back farther. And then one could surely critique Rousseau. You could say, you know, if there are feminist critiques available. There are particular accounts of what he wants to qu the question, the natural quality of or how it, um, or you know, how it originated that we might, how it could be justified that we might want to quibble with. But I think what's important is to think about what the work that the critique is mm -hmm, doing, mm -hmm. the genealogy mm -hmm, is doing. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that it's designed to take out, so first we're going to try to figure out what the, or, by figuring out what the origin of inequality is, we're going to say, look, there's basically no reason to think that anything other than the most rudimentary physical forms of inequality have their origin in nature. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. all from this process mm -hmm. of civilization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But on the basis of that, then we can say, well, now we're going to look at the institutions that we've designed that are, in fact, going to exacerbate mm -hmm. these inequalities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're going to be able to critique those as well. And then we can let go a little bit of this idea of human nature as yes. this thing inside of us which we can't quite grasp. But this right. is a tool or a right. sort of a method. And then now we can start looking at, are the institutions working for us? Yes. Yeah. And that's the real, I, I don't know, to me, that's the most attractive feature of, of especially the social contract. Um, it's thinking about what types of institutions might we have, men as they are, laws as they might be, you know, it right. is this, it has this sort of radical re-envisioning of institutions. It's also, I mean, one of the features of the second discourse that I love the very most is this, the contrast between the social contract that he describes there and the social contract right. that yeah, emerges you... in the second. Yeah, um, this is sometimes uh, referred to as the specious contract. So the, um, Again, this is one of my very favorite passages, really, again, in all of the history of political thought. So, <laughs> to this end, after exhibiting his to his neighbors the horror of a situation that armed all of them against one another, that made their possessions as burdensome to them as their needs, and in which no one found safety in either poverty or wealth, he easily invented specious reasons to bring them around to his goal. Let us unite, he told them, to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and secure for everyone the possession of what belongs to him. Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform, which favor no one, and which in a way make up for the vagaries of fortune by subjecting the powerful and the weak to mutual duties. In a word, instead of turning our forces against one another, let us gather them into a supreme power that might govern us according to wise laws and so forth. 
much less than the equivalent of this discourse, was needed to sway crude, easily seduced men. And he says this, this must have been the origin of society and laws which gave the weak new fetters. So in a way, the weak, the poor, are duped into thinking, well, look, we're going to have these beautiful egalitarian institutions. Right. And so, but in so doing, in creating these institutions that are simply going to codify these existing inequalities, okay. we lead to this great political inequality. And so the, sec the social contract takes the same sort of language right. of egalitarian contracting but makes it so that it enables freedom as opposed to unfreedom. So this first one, this specious contract, yeah. is the, someone who's a bit more powerful yes. convinces a person who's a bit less powerful to yes. say, we'll, we'll enter into a contract, yes. we'll obey the same yes. laws, to all the same yes. rules apply, you'll be safe, yes. you'll be able to walk down the country road or the street and you won't yes. be attacked because I'll control the police as well. So I'm going to give you some protection. Yes. And the weak have to consent. Yes. And he has this frequently, he says, People are dumb enough to consent. Yes. And he said also, power depends on consent. Yes. It's actually not that someone can control so many people because there are not enough weapons and armies in the world. Yeah. But people agree to this. They agree so to so it. what's for him amazing civilization is we voluntarily step into our unfreedom. Yes. Yeah, and that's a really, I mean, that's a huge question for political science and for us today. I mean, so if you think that in fact, the, the many are capable of expropriating the few, why do they not? Right. <laughs> well, that's a big question been for a long yeah. time, whether a system can last. Exactly. Right, that's right. So this is the specious contract. And then in the social contract, he gives us a better version, all right? Yeah. He's trying to come up with yeah. So what's the better version of this? Well, it's not someone being duped. Well, <laughs> so there are, a couple of, <laughs> there are a couple of things that are different. Yeah. So one are the bounds of, of inequality. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if you have a society that is gravely economically unequal, the, it's going to be probably unlikely that they're going to be able to institute a contract that's really going to be unfair, on fair terms mm -hmm, in this way. Mm -hmm, so you have mm -hmm. to have background conditions of a degree of equality, I think, for them even to get off the ground. Um, so I should say, in terms of the specious contract, what's important to keep in mind first is the sort of the psychology that gets the poor to consent in this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And we might think that actually Amoprof, this idea of esteem, okay, okay. is doing some work there. That you think, well, you know, perhaps maybe one day, you know, I want, I want to be in a society with these people and perhaps someday I might be able to attain their status. Oh, um, right. Okay. So that might, so perhaps their willingness to be seduced or duped or whatever is a function of their own desire for recognition. So just a side question. Yeah. So in this kind of social contract, yeah. there couldn't be sort of inborn rules of status. So it can't really work for an aristocracy. If I think I could maybe at some point attain that position, it means I, I can, anybody can do it. So there's a kind of possibility of advancement or... Uh, Yes, I guess the question, I mean... Within what, reason, I mean, there's... Within reason. So, I think social... Mo so, mm -hmm. I think social mobility, the desire to be um, superior mm -hmm. in relative status, I think he's going to think that that itself, that that aim is in a way pernicious. Okay, okay, okay. That any time it, that, that my well-being... Right. depends upon me moving up relative to other people, Yeah, um, I'm going to be less free. But this is interesting. So what you're saying is not just the way I said people are stupid. They're saying it's in them to have an investment in this, in this possibility. Yeah. Yeah. So they hook into something that's in them to say, I could maybe advance my own status. That's right. So it's that's not right. to blame them in a way they're too dumb. It's not a story to say, the poor are dumb and get exploited. He said, we all have this in us right. to that's buy right. into this kind of arrangement. That's okay. right, that's right. Okay. Um, and I think that's really, I mean, I think that that's a really important point, that it's not so, I mean, it's true, he describes them as easily seduced and duped or whatever, the people, the man who found people stupid enough to believe him. Right. It's not mere stupidity, it's not really stupidity, it's ambition in a way. Okay. It's ambition that makes. That's it's a, a different way of framing it, right? Yeah, right. I, I think that that ends yeah. up doing a lot of the work. And so social contract, I think, um, takes as a presupposition that we're all capable of, of in a way, of accepting a, a degree of inequality, mm -hmm. but that we recognize that we will 
all benefit from a society that is much more equal and in which our respect for each other hinges upon recognizing it again, in a way, the essential equality of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of each other's, mm -hmm. you know, capacity for, you know, political agency, moral agency in a way, mm -hmm. even if we know that there are still going to be other sources of inequality, and even if we accept the existence of property in a certain degree of inequality with respect to that as well. So we accept some inequality, we accept it's unavoidable. Some inequality. Yes. So if someone's going to live differently from other people, okay. That's right, that's right. But how do we get to this kind of mutual respect part? That's, That's going to be really hard. I mean, so part of the story about the background conditions of the social contract, I mean, you can see some of it in the dedicatory letter for the second discourses in his description of Geneva. But it's another going, mythology. Another mythology. Where he writes this kind of another tribute, mythology. this is the greatest place in the world. That's and then right. the people of Geneva said, this is not quite how That's it is. Right. <laughs> That's right. You're going to need a high degree of homogeneity. Actually. Okay. You're going to need a small society, mm -hmm. um, a small homogeneous society. You're going to need a sense, uh, you know, there's the account of the civil religion in social contract. Oh, right. yes. You know, so there are a bunch of, in a way, shared norms, shared familiarity with yep. each other. Um, in addition to a, a relative degree of economic equality that is going to enable people to have that sort of relationship to each other. Barring that, it's not as if he thinks that the conditions of the social contract are going to be able to get off the ground. And you can see, you know, in, he, I mean, he writes these constitutions, he writes this constitution for Poland, which right. famously departs from features of the social contract by introduces representation, but be, Poland is much larger right. than Geneva, right. and that makes a difference. But when you say that he describes originally yeah. his idea where there's a shared set of values yeah. as yeah. a civic religion or something like yeah. that, or norms, yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you extrapolate as a political theorist to say what's useful about this for how we think today about legitimacy of government and how I can protect my freedom and liberty from people who want to just dupe me into giving it up so I feel safe? So he says we trade in our sense of safety all the time for our independence or our freedom. That's right. That's right. Um, so I guess the challenge is, so we have these large pluralistic societies and we want to recognize diversity, but we also have to aim, I mean, whether or not we should, a big question is whether we should aim at the common good, whether there's a common good. Okay. I mean, that's one way to understand, yeah. an easy way to understand the concept yeah. of the general will, which in a way strips of it the willing part, the volitional point. Uh, uh, point. Mm -hmm. But if you say, well, look, there is in a given community, there is a general will out there, which we would each we would each individually and independently will if we were perfectly moral. Right. It is, in a way, it's transcendent. So there is this general will out okay. there for a particular community. And what we do when we try to figure out what laws should bind us is to identify that general will, which is ours. That's the source of autonomy, right. of this activity of self-legislation that we get in the social contract. But the yeah. common good, is it, is it wrong for me to think, I think all communities struggle with that. So in America, we have certain yeah. <clears throat> principles, yeah. inalienable rights, yes. sort of an, an idea of what it means to be American. Yes. It's supposed to be inclusive, let's hope, equal, et cetera. But so when you're saying it's difficult to think of that, I thought all communities ultimately try to have a more or less defined idea of what the common good is, that we all belong to this project. We shall survive as a community. That's yeah. one project. Yes. And that used to be maybe nation states. Now maybe it's the European Union or it's a community yes. of people. But you, you think that's difficult because it's, it's, is it difficult because it's hard to define or? I think it's hard to define. I think it's hard to know what, that, what it actually looks like. I think all institutions, basically, are going to have distributive consequences. That is, that they're going to have different effects um, for people who are differently situated. So and what does that mean, distributive consequences? I think it's going to be, um, I think any norm that we might identify, even a constitutional law, right. I think once we imagine that judges, are that legislation is going to give them, uh, give it, is going to flesh it out right. once Supreme, uh, Supreme Court justices are going to right. interpret it in a particular way. I think most of these decisions are going to have different and perhaps disparate effects okay. depending on where you are in a society. So given... So not position, everyone is going to always have a benefit. That's right. And that's right. could one get to the place, well, yeah, not every law is going to give you a direct benefit. Some yes. you may 
curtail some of your yes. right but other ones will give you that so yes. there's a larger balance on balance the laws are generally good for you right yes yeah and we might get to that we might but trying to think about something that would be transcend that and indeed mm -hmm. i think rousseau is calling upon us to do that rousseau is calling upon us not to when so first of all we have to imagine a, a community in which we are all actually participating creating legislation which of course is very right. far from us but if we can imagine taking this vantage point where we're not allowing our particular will our private interest to right. prevail but right. we're identifying what the common interest is right and so if i vote in fact if i i mean this is a complicated right. part of social contract but if i vote and i find myself in the minority i'm not I have mistaken what, in fact, the common good is. I've mistaken the general will. Okay. And had I been, had I prevailed, okay. I would have been wrong, and I would have been unfree. Okay. There's a lot of apparatus there, and yeah. it's going to be prob and we're yeah. going to yeah. be troubled by some of it. I mean, which you know, tons of Rousseau's commentators over time have been troubled by. Um, so the idea that there might be something that would be uniquely in the common interest. I think we can get ourselves to that. I think the question is how we might identify it, how we might know when we had hit upon it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in what cases would we have any confidence in saying we were right or we were wrong about it. And what you just said, when if you if you vote and you 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 the people you vote for lose, it has it's linked to your sense of freedom. Yeah. But there's a kind of sweet yeah. spot or a moment yeah. when you could think actually, I have become free yeah. by subjecting myself to the general will that's right but it's a very odd thing in a yes. way so he says yes. there is freedom is possible for us outside of the state of nature we could that's feel right. free but that to me seems like such a precarious moment when you think i'm actually free by agreeing and consenting yes. to being governed in accordance with other rules that are not just mine that's right that's right it's yes. but it's a really important idea that freedom is not for him this kind of individualistic, I put my stake in the ground kind of, that, that's the end of freedom actually. That's right. No, our freedom consists, in a way our freedom consists in our subjection, but our, uh, to the right, terms our of the general will, our subjection. Our subjection. Okay. Yeah, um, but to the general will, that is we, you know, our freedom consists in autonomy, in creating laws for our community that emerge from our will directly and to it, and we are obliged to we're obliged to obey by virtue of right. that fact, right. and so yes, the idea that we would be unfree if we got our way mm -hmm. is a you know that we would okay. be right. unfree right. if my private interest had prevailed right. that I would feel myself to be unfree. It's because our the link between freedom and that which the community wills, that which the community is actually engaged, you know, is yeah. seeking for itself. That's a hard concept for us today. And it's, you know, this distinction that Rousseau consistently draws between the general will and the will of all. Right. This is also, we've moved from the second discourse well into the social, the social contract. Funding. So yeah. t tell me what is the difference between the general will and the yeah. will of, and the general and will is not something we agree to, we sign on the proverbial dotted line. Right? No, no. So the will of all is essentially the aggregation or the summing up of our private wills. Okay. And he says, whatever we're doing, that's not, that's not going to get us to the general will. Okay. We have to set aside in a way. It doesn't mean that we have to totally suppress our private interest or our particular wills and we have to lock it away. But we have to, when we, when we come to the assembly and we vote on laws, we think to ourselves, what is the general will that is ours? What actually reflects right. the, the interest of my community? And in doing that, if we can do that, if we can identify that, and hopefully we can all pretty much do that, the product of that decision making is going to mm -hmm. reliably mm -hmm. track the general will. Mm -hmm. Now we might get, a, now he says, look, mm -hmm. he's not naive about this. He says, you know, when we start, you know, the Republic is marked by dissension and debate and unhappiness when we start becoming plural right. societies, when parties and factions right. or whatever start emerging, then it's going to be harder and harder for us to identify the general will. The general will still exists. It is transcendent. It is pure. It is unaffected by this. Right. But our votes are much less okay. likely okay. to reveal that. Okay. 
And so in a way, we're in a community that looks nothing like the sort of community that is going to be well situated to yeah, identify the general will. We are that sort of pluralistic, partial society that Rousseau worries about. In addition to having this very severe economic, right, social right, right. inequality <clears throat> that would make it impossible for right. us to uh, imagine the conditions of freedom uh, you know, existing. But it's quite moving in a way that he thinks we are pretty much always alienated from our nature because yes. we live in civilization. Yes. We don't, co and at the same time, we have a capacity to find ourselves again in community. Yes. I mean, it's very moving to say that freedom, I mean, it sounds yes. paradoxical, but actually that you could become free by consenting yes. to this general will, which is not a written document or anything like that. But just, and so there's a lot of the power of the imagination or something that we would know or have a sense of what that is. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's quite powerful. And I, I think that's one of the reasons, I guess, why Rousseau remains powerful to think we have this capacity to free ourselves. Yes. Yes, it's beautiful that we can, and our capacity to, to free ourselves rests in other people. Right. But the challenge is, as we've been talking about, <laughs> that the, the problem is that that's right. also our source of our profound right. misery. Right. Right. So the question is, how do we establish right. relations with each other that don't hinge upon my need for recognition from you, my desire for right. esteem from you, your, right. my desire for, you know, to submit myself to... Um, One know, thing to would be, we at least we're aware of it. Yes. I mean, Rousseau gives us the tools to think. Yeah. If I'm just driven by trying to impress you or getting your approval, he yes. said, be aware of that that's leading you in the wrong direction. Right. So I think at least that, that's very much part of the whole enlightenment idea that he, as long as we know that, we may guard against it. Yes. Right. So because that's new that he introduces this, that right. self-regard or this kind of self. Right. right. It's, um, it seems to resonate still today and sort of your work is about legitimacy also of democratic institutions. Uh, but the general will is a flexible thing, right? Or it's not a static thing that we subscribe to and then it remains this project. I mean, it ha is it, does it, it has to evolve, I, that's what I'm trying to well, ask. Well, the general will is, the, is this will for a particular community. And so when we're creating laws, and these laws need not be stagnant, we're doing so in line with the general will of a particular right. community. And the general will is going to is going to guide our selection. So one formalization would be a constitution of that. Yeah. But I it's mean, only one. That's right. There are fundamental laws for a community, and the fundamental laws themselves are subject to revision if, you know, under, you know. Right. Uh, so there are both fundamental laws and there are ordinary laws. But, but so there is sort of a constitutional sort of apparatus in a particular community. Um, but all of them require enactment in accordance with the general will and they all re they require our actual activity as citizens right and the activity would be that we constantly reflect on and check what this will is or do is it a is it an active yeah. process i mean there's a lot of yeah. Rousseau seems to put a lot of expectation on the citizen to participate right. even just in terms of thinking about the political process. Yeah. Well, that's so when we come into an assembly, and we do, we all need to come into the assembly as citizens. Again, we can't assign rep, uh, representatives to do this for us. We all have to do it. Okay. How would this work? <laughs> well, we need a small community, right? Okay. Um, no wiki, no. <laughs> okay, right, right. So we all have to but in a big country up. like this. In a big country like this, this is that's not going to, yes, this is not, I mean, in a big country yeah. like this, it's going to be difficult to think of us yeah. as even possessing a, you know, meaningfully possessing a general will. We're going to end up having society. Well, it's interesting yeah. in this country that we have such things, things such as primaries, yeah. where it's kind of raucous debates and you think and you're hashing out principles and all that. There's, yes. There are moments in this country where we yes. try to preserve this kind of robust debate yes. and direct interaction. Yes, right? I think that's right. I mean, so for sure, leaving aside the general will, the Rousseauian message is surely in part about political participation. That, mm -hmm. you know, he says the English think they're free, but they're greatly mistaken about it because they rely <laughs> on rep representation. Okay. You know, they're okay. free. Right. We're right. only free insofar as we ourselves are actively participating. Um, what about referenda and things like that, where people feel, well, we want this to put us to a referendum so a lot of people can talk about it? Uh, yeah. I mean, these are, these are, 
questions that are moving us um, sort of away from Rousseau, because Rousseau, again, he's going to think that um, most of the stuff that are subjected to referendums are not going to be the type of things that that assemblies are going to be voting on, which okay. are be much more abstract. Um, I think one, I think there is a basic tension in American political life between our desire for direct, for so-called direct democracy, for enacting um, referendums, and our belief that, in fact, representatives are able to make, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, better decisions. Mm -hmm. And there are good reasons to think that representatives are able to make better decisions. It creates a smaller body. Presumably, you've got a people, uh, a, a body of people who are tasked mm -hmm. professionally mm -hmm. with thinking through these different sorts of questions. They're able to debate. They're mm -hmm. able to compromise. The party apparatus helps them to have you know, to gather evidence and right. support their views. There are lots of reasons to think that perhaps the representative system might be, might all told, give us better decisions. Yep. But at the same time, I think we are pulled in this sort of Rousseauian way to think, well, no, we've lost our freedom We've here. been duped. <laughs> we've been duped, or that there are certain, dis I mean, the, the, the weird thing about it is that there's not a consistency in terms of what we think we ought to have a say in. That oftentimes that what's being subject, what we're, you know, the types of questions that referendums addressed right. are not exactly the most fundamental right, questions right, right. of then, a society. Yeah. I mean, they might be, we can imagine a constitutional amendment process that might be much more direct. We right. can think that, in fact, if we're going to ever have a say, it ought to be on these really fundamental questions governing the structure of our political process. But instead, you know, we have, like we have right. sort of so small parts of how we live our That's lives. Right. Kind of thing. That's right. That's right. And is that, in fact, sapping us from other forms of political agency that might be more easy? The tension you identified in the American politics between this idea of we have to have representatives who may be better qualified and adequately represent us, and we want to directly also yes. govern ourselves because otherwise we may be afraid, like yeah. also. Do you think that's a product, is it a tension that can be managed out of existence? Is there a better way? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if we can manage it out of existence. I mean, I do think that there, the tensions between wanting to, everybody to participate yeah. on equal terms and a desire for expertise, I think is right. a basic yeah. one for yeah. Uh, yeah. political, you know, for all polities. And, um, and, and as for so you would say, with the complexity of modern life, right. it's a big problem because we have put ourselves into a position of un because life is way too complex. I do not want, I mean, I want some experts to manage some parts of my life, That's right. like medical experts. That's right. I would like the, you know, Department yeah. of Health and Human Services to be run by people who actually know what they're doing. There should yeah. be scientists. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, but there's, I think, a question, sometimes um, the challenge is, what are citizens competent to decide? Right. And, yeah. you know, my sense is that they're more competent to decide a lot of questions than we tend to think, but, the que but how to figure out what sorts of questions institutionally. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we have really a debate really in New York right now and in other countries about vaccinations. Right. So it's a huge debate of should right. people decide how, this is actually a very Rousseauian question, right. should you yes. decide how to raise your children or should you let some experts tell you what to do? Right. right. And part of, you know, <laughs> and Rousseau is no liberal, but part of the liberal tradition is also, well, no, you know, I want to have, um, uh, you know, the I want to have the right, right to be able to make my decisions That's for right. my own family. I don't, I'm free from government interference. In what would you call him if he's not a liberal? Uh, like, I th he's a, a Republican, a small R Republican. Small R Republican. Republican right. yeah. Right. And can you say two things to conclude sort of his impact? Do you think he died, I think, about 20 years before the French Revolution yeah. took place and more yeah. than that of the yeah. American Revolution? What has been his impact? As I said earlier, as you know, he's been read by just about everybody yeah. and appropriated in productive ways also. Yeah. I mean, he leads us to Thoreau in this country, to Marx, to Lenin. I mean, you know, Kant says he's this is the greatest and most important. Yeah. Schopenhauer says one of the most four most important novels in the world. The French Robespierre says this is the man who gave yes. me my sense of who I am, right? Yes. Very importantly. And in America, in the American Revolution, and the American constitutional debates, does he figure there as a presence, or is it more Locke and other people? Yeah, I'm not. You know, I wouldn't say that he's that he's a, a central figure, but the, um, 
you know, I do think that the capacity to think about the circumstances of our freedom and the way in which our political institutions can realize or inhibit that freedom is crucially important for democracy and for people who have thought about democracy for in the centuries intervening. Right. That, you know, and in particular for these questions of what what type of participation, what type of political participation would we want? Under what circumstances can we think of ourselves as being free insofar as we're engaging in these sorts of um, political activities? How, f how free can we mm -hmm. be under conditions of severe inequality? Mm -hmm, that's perhaps mm -hmm. the, the crucial one for us well, today. Yeah. I think, I think uh, that's Rousseau's lasting legacy. Do you think that is the, one of the most urgent political questions today from I your do. own perspective? I do. I mean, I think the question of economic inequality is a, is a very deep one. But I do think that the question, the more narrow question about of political inequality, of how we want to think about political institutions as you know, reproducing certain types of inequality yeah. of elite-driven politics, whether or not we can imagine a more full realization of the aim of one person, one vote, the challenges and the threats to enfranchisement that we've seen in many places. But the effort also to to challenge that. I mean this the felon enfranchise the uh, felon enfranchisement movement in Florida in Florida and elsewhere yeah. um, I think is a very attractive one on mm -hmm. these grounds. The idea that what we want to do is you know, we want to enable people to have the uh, circumstances of political freedom right. in their right. hands, and we want them to be able to, at, at a minimum, participate in self-government going forward, mm -hmm. such as it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for this conversation. It's, I mean, it's really um, illuminating to hear how he lays out problems that are still so much with us, but it seems to be he's opening them up for us rather yes. than giving us the answers, right? Yes, yes, I think that's right. He, it, the questions in a way that he poses to us, I agree, are, are some of the most important ones that we have. We're going to still live with them for, yes, for a while. He won't yeah, resolve them. All right. Yeah. So, Melissa, thank you so thank much you for so being much. on Think About It today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you.